السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وكفى وسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى لا سيما المصطفى صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا My dear viewers, welcome to another live edition of Ask Uda And here is a quick reminder with our contact information uh, beginning with area code 002-023855 132 alternatively record 002 then 0100 we've got two whatsapp numbers area code 001-347-80625 and finally area code 001-361-489-1503 we're live on my facebook page m salah official and the youtube channel uh, dr muhammad salah and I highly recommend that you brothers and sisters subscribe to the channel and also uh, share the page and the YouTube channel in order to widen the broadcast and spread their word, uh, spread the word and share their word. Let me take a couple of depending questions while waiting for your valuable calls and concerns. Uh, Rahnama Khan is asking I have changed my surname after getting married to my husband's surname should I change it back to my median name in Surah Al-Ahzab the Almighty Allah commanded that one should not change their median name and their family name to any other name and that is perceived as a major sin so you find the Almighty Allah says ادعوهم لآبائهم هو أقسط عند الله and that is even in the case of adopting an orphan or a child if you know who is their parent then they should be named after their fathers they should be called and ascribed to their fathers that is the right way before the Almighty Allah other than that that's a sin I would like to add to that that Khadija Bint Khuwailid radiallahu anha. What did he just say? Khadija bint Khuwailid, the mother of the believers. She was married to whom? To Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Who was greater? Khuwailid or Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? How come that her name was not Khadija Muhammad? She's the wife of the greatest man ever walked the earth. Likewise with Aisha, Hafsa, Zainab. Uh, all the mothers of the believers kept their father's names, never changed their name after the name of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, or his family because this is the right way before Allah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Brother Abdul Jalil from Ethiopia, welcome to Ask Uda Abdul Jalil. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you, our Sheikh? I'm doing great, alhamdulillah, and thank you for asking, Akhi Abdul Jalil. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. So, uh, share our Sheikh, uh, I would like to, um, I have, you know, my question is, I would like to ask, you know, uh, I have been posted on uh, my Instagram, uh, I mean, my YouTube, uh, I have posted video, but the, the video is, uh, it was without t shirts and which means my body, every can can see my body. Uh, so my, my, th my second question is... Well, I didn't get your first question, Abdul Jalil. Oh, I said um, I have posted uh, on my YouTube account video. With, uh, my video is about, uh, you know, uh, I have been talking about, you know, fitness, but my body can appear to others. Mm. I, I, I mean uh, without uh, T-shirt, without T-shirts or uh, anything. Okay, I got the question now. So you're asking about the ruling on showing your body on the YouTube or the Instagram 
or even posting uh, a video or a picture of your muscles. And question is, mm -hmm. my second question is, Wallah, Sheikh, I, I would like to know to memorize Holy Quran. I have been trying to memorize Holy Quran while I was from, you know, when I was like uh, five years old. I tried my best, but uh, it wasn't possible for me. But now uh, I I have a good dream, and even right now I have a certain memorization. So uh, can you tell me the best way? to memorize Holy Quran because my dream is to memorize Holy Quran and to be Iman, inshallah. All right, sure, inshallah. May Allah make it easy for you and for all of those who love to memorize the Quran to achieve their goal and most importantly to comprehend it and obviously implement it. So Abdul Jalid from Ethiopia, uh, you know, the social media is a wonderful means of communicating with people. And it, it has really brought the whole world together. It has really become like a single village, the whole world. But we as Muslims have some uh, rules and regulations, guidelines as what is the best way to utilize the social media with and for, and what is uh, what to do and what not to do in this regard. So showing the muscles, we know that the aura of a man from the navel to the knees. But it is unnecessary to take off your shirt and show your muscles that is definitely showing off. If you are a fitness instructor and in the uh, gym or you're showing the uh, trainees uh, and you're the coach, that is the, in the gym, that is understood. But to post that online, I wouldn't, I wouldn't advise you to do it rather I would advise totally the opposite in addition to there's something that we as Muslims gotta keep in mind that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in al ayna haq al ayn here refers to the evil eye yani envy some people when they show their muscles then uh, they get a viral infection then they lose weight and they become powerless and they get sick and they even die and people wonder what happened to them this guy was a muscular person was a fitness person and was a coach what happened is it could be due to uh, envy so we believe in that that the evil eye and the envious eye could harm the person and that's why the person should be protective should not display his muscles and show off before people. That is my advice to you. As far as your first question, second question, the issue of memorizing the Quran. You remember the hadith in which uh, Aisha radiallahu anha narrated when the Messenger of Allah was asked, O Prophet of Allah, which deed is best? He said, Adwamuhu wa inqal. The one which is persistent, even if it is little. We'll get to that, inshallah, at the school. Assalamu alaikum. Muhammad from the USA, welcome to Ask Oda, Akhi Muhammad. Walaikum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Sheikh. Sheikh, I have a question regarding uh, istikhara. I did a istikhara for you, and uh, I asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to show me in a dream, if it's a positive dream, uh, to uh, go ahead with it, and if it's a negative dream, do not go ahead with it. I did not want to go with the uh, nafs or conscience because I know I'm inclined to a particular thing. And uh, is it a correct way to uh, interpret it in a dream or is it just my feeling? Uh, please guide me. Well, relying on what you said that you've asked Allah, if it is a correct way to show it to me in my uh, it's a supplication. You can always ask for anything which is permissible. But it is not the correct way to decide based on that because we all know that the results of istikhara are not limited to seeing a dream. Basically, the results of istikhara, if it is go for it, you will find it easy and facilitated towards go for it. And if the results of istikhara is not to do it, then Allah the Almighty will hinder you and will put uh, you know, uh, obstacles on the way of that thing 
uh, to be achieved. So basically, you should not keep asking, how come I didn't see a dream? Because that is not necessarily the result. It may happen, again, we'll repeat it. It may happen that you see a dream and inspiring you or you feel comfy after you woke up, you say, subhanAllah, I woke up and my heart is so open to do or not to do, okay? But this is not necessarily the case that every time or oftenly whenever you pray istikhara, you go to sleep so that you see what will happen in the dream. Not necessarily. The dua is very clear. The supplication is very clear. If you know this is good for me, then facilitate it for me and make it easy for me. If you know that in your knowledge this is bad for me, whether for dunya or hereafter, then israfni anhu wasrifhu anni. Take me away out of it and take it away from me and decide for me what is best. So uh, now I want to resume answering Abdul Jalil's second question by after this call again. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Muhammad from the KSA. Assalamu alaikum, Muhammad. Wa alaikum salasi. How are you? Alhamdulillah. Thank you for asking. You tell me, how are you, brother Muhammad, yourself? Alhamdulillah, say, Alhamdulillah. I just would like to say, say, you know, you are doing a great, wonderful job. MashaAllah, because of this, uh, many of the, um, you know, people who are ignorant uh, is following uh, Islam right away. Let Allah make you and your effort a um, uh, good deed and uh, accept all Amen. the Muslims uh, and give everything, uh, all blessings to all Muslims, uh, Shaykh. That's why I just Amen. would like to tell you. I mean, I mean, thank you, Brother Muhammad. May Allah accept. I have one question, Shaykh. You know, I no. seen that uh, you are saying regarding the name change. You know, say an example. Uh, my wife actually uh, changes, but changes has done the, uh, you know, after the marriage. But the problem, my question is, Shaykh. If it is going back to change again, it will be really uh, difficult in the passport, you know. So if, instead of that, can I only tell the people that we didn't change the name? In, the, in, the, in, in paperwork, it will be there, but in reality, we are t talking outside that, no, we didn't change. We will tell only the, we will introduce only our uh, um, uh, first name, our uh, old, old name. Is that okay, Shay? That's my question. Okay, got it. Okay, thank Brother you. Muhammad thank from you. the KSA. His question is a follow-up question to uh, Mrs. Khan about uh, changing her name after her husband's uh, surname. So he says that now we've done that. It's common maybe in the Indian subcontinent. It's common in the USA. It's common in the, in the West, in, uh, in Europe. And it's, uh, you know, it's sad that a woman uh, simply gives up on her father's name or maiden name and she adopts her husband's name. Then if she is divorced, she goes back to her father's name, the median name. And then if she m marries somebody else, she takes another surname and back and forth and back and forth. Allah said, Ud'uhum li'aba'ihim wa aqsatu indallah. You keep your name. Why doesn't the husband? Don't you think it is a woman's right? Don't you think it is a wife's right to be proud of her name, of her family name, or, uh, to keep her father's name or her surname or last name, you know, of course. So Islam gave her the right and forbade changing her name to anybody else's name. So now what I'm trying to say is, if the uh, uh, changing of the name is doable and feasible, then you should do it at the earliest chance. If it is not feasible, then obviously among people, uh, they know her bar by her name and her last name, family's name. And at the first chance, whenever you have the opportunity to change the name back to her family's name, you should do that. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Umar from Qatar. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. How are you, Sheikh? Alhamdulillah. Thank you for asking, Brother Umar. Go ahead. Uh, uh, Sheikh, I have two questions. Yeah. Uh, one is, uh, my wife recently had to go through a TNC process uh, because she was pregnant and uh, it did not happen. So the doctor recommended to go for TNC. So she went through it. Now it's been two and a half weeks 
and she has no bleeding inside. Can she pray or does she need to wait for a particular time period before we, after which she can pray? Okay. Okay. And uh, 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 yeah, how old was the yeah. pregnancy when she went for the uh, uh, miscarriage? Uh, nine weeks, yeah. Nine weeks. Okay. Uh, Sheikh, uh, second question is, uh, I am, uh, uh, like, when we search for jobs, so in different websites like LinkedIn, we reach out to people uh, who are working in a particular company and we ask them to please refer up a CV for this particular job, which is available in their company. So is it, uh, from Islamic point of view, is it, is this practice permissible? Uh, because uh, we are praying from Allah that Allah will, uh, you know, Allah will give us a risk and new jobs or whatever the, uh, whatever the benefits and everything is. But, uh, and there is one hadith that, uh, that said, uh, if, if we need even the shoelace, we need to ask from Allah, not from anyone else. And there was one scholar who interpreted uh, this hadith in a way, he was saying that if you ask someone some favor, ask once. You may request him or remind him twice or for the second time. But third time, don't do it because maybe, maybe it can be considered as a shirk because you are asking a favor from someone but you are not praying from Allah. So I just wanted to know that is this practice permissible in Islam? Okay. I got your questions, Brother uh, Umar from Qatar. Um, and uh, let me uh, answer Abdul Jalil's question, his second question from uh, Ethiopia. Uh, he was asking about uh, an advice in order to be able to memorize the glorious Quran. He says that is his dream. So seek the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through invoking him and asking him to make it easy for you. And indeed, he confirmed in Surah Al-Qamar four times that he has made Al-Quran easy for everyone to read, to understand, to even memorize. So, فَهَلْ مِنْ مُدَّكِرْ And the greatest number of Huffaz, those who have memorized the Quran, is actually from among non-Arab. But in order to achieve that, one has to follow a specific scheme, which is to have a daily portion of the Qur'an. First of all, you have to master the reading of the Qur'an. And master it and check yourself out with the perfect and professional reciter of the Qur'an. Because if you end up memorizing while making lahn or mistakes, um, it will be extremely difficult to correct yourself after a while. Memorizing is similar to carving. So make certain from the beginning that you have learned how to read the Quran properly. Then, alhamdulillah, I think uh, one of my students was 70 plus, mashallah, she's a revert. And uh, she started a few years back after she converted to Islam. She's an American sister and non-Arab. And um, a few days ago, she was telling me that uh, even though every day she takes a few verses by few verses, she has two more juz to finish memorizing the entire Qur'an. So it is exactly as the Prophet ﷺ said, أَدْوَمُهُ وَإِنْقَلْ You take a little bit by a little bit. It doesn't matter how long would it take. But if you end up taking one page, one page every day, that is 600 days. That's a couple years, less than two years. Uh, if you take half page, five lines, every day which is not much it, it may be three and a half years still not bad okay but what matters most is the revising you memorized now you need to keep up with the revising and there is of course a lot of schemes uh, online in order to follow the revising uh, table so that you would not forget what you have memorized Particularly if you recite what you have memorized on a regular basis in your prayer. Uh, Umar from Qatar asked about uh, the Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. 
our fan from Pakistan. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Go ahead, Brother Arfan. I hear you. I am Dr. Iqbal Zafar from Karachi, Pakistan. Okay. I want to ask a question. Is eating fraud haram or halal? What, what is the question, Dr. Iqbal? Uh, yeah. Uh, the question is, is eating frogs haram or halal? Eating frogs. Okay. I got your question. Yes. Yes. It is forbidden to yes. eat. It is forbidden to eat frogs. Because the Prophet ﷺ actually forbade killing frogs. So in order to eat it, you have to kill it. And killing frogs is forbidden. The Prophet ﷺ forbade uh, killing the frogs. So its consumption is forbidden as well. Thank you, Dr. Irfan from uh, Pakistan, Karachi. And uh, I would like to take this uh, opportunity to share with the viewers, inshallah, I'll be visiting Pakistan very soon, having a tour. Also be visiting Karachi, Islamabad, Lahore, and uh, many other cities in Pakistan, inshallah. Um, abortion, uh, or in case of miscarriage or deliberate abortion due to medical uh, justifiable reason. What happened to the bleeding afterward? If the baby is formed, if the baby is formed and you can recognize hands, head, nose and, and fingers and toes, so the bleeding afterward will be treated similar to the bleeding whenever the woman gives birth, the postpartum bleeding. Which means this is similar to the menses. It's maximum according to the vast majority of the scholars, 40 days. And what is beyond 40 days should be treated as irregular bleeding unless if that coincides her regular monthly period. Yani, let's say that she finished her post-delivery bleeding on Thursday. And this Thursday happens to coincide her regular monthly period before she got pregnant. So she would allow another six, seven days or whatever number of days that she used to experience the bleeding normally uh, before the pregnancy. But if the, uh, you know, the baby was not formed, like you, know, you just said that eight months or nine months, so it's like a piece of uh, blood clot, then the bleeding after that miscarriage is perceived as an irregular bleeding, which means soon after the operation, you perform ghusl, if you're capable, of course, and offer the prayer on a regular basis. And whatever you miss, you make it up. Maybe you're tired because you're fatigued after the operation, but you still have to pray even on bed. Why? Because this bleeding is not the menses. This bleeding is a bleeding of, you know, uh, the sickness or the post-operation. It is not similar to a nefas or the post-delivery bleeding. Asking from people for help once and twice and several times does not contradict the concept of tawakkul. Does not contradict the concept of tawakkul. Allah the Almighty says in Surah An-Nisa, "Man yashfa shafa'atan hasanatan yakul lahu nasibun minha." Whoever intercedes for a good cause, he will be rewarded. Will have a share of the reward. A man came to the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, asking for financial help. And he didn't have any for a ride. He said, but go to so and so. He went and the man happily supported the beggar or the person who was in need. So the Prophet wasallam remarked saying that أَدَّالُ عَلَى الْخَيْرِ كَفَاعِلِهِ or لَهُ أَجْرُ فَاعِلِهِ Whoever shows people goodness or kindness and they act upon it they will be rewarded and he will have a similar reward assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh abu abdul rahman from italy assalamu alaikum <laughs> alhamdulillah could you please mute your device you need to hear me from your handset please 
Okay, okay, sorry. That's okay. Uh, my question is one of my one of my brother, his income is not sufficient for him to uh, I mean to feed his family. Before the end month finish, the money he used to get his monthly salary is used to finish. So right now he has four children, alhamdulillah. So one of my brother told him that like he should stop burning right now until he get, he get a, a, I mean, work that the money will be at least uh, start for him to feed his family. Because every month, before the month finish, he demand money from our family members. So that advice, is it a good advice or not? I want to know that one. Please help me. Okay. Thank you, Abu Abdul Rahman from Italy. Thank you, I said. <laughs> You're most welcome. Okay. Um, so asking help from people does not contradict the concept of tawakkul. Asking once and twice and several times, there is nothing wrong with that. When you ask people whom you assume that they can uh, help. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, admired al-ansar in the Quran. Check out Surah Al-Hashr for helping al-muhajireen. And there are some people who are helpless, maybe because of disability, not able, not able to work, or you need somebody to assist you to get a job or to start off a business or whatever. So you can ask once or twice and, and, and three times. There is no limit for how many you ask. There is no uh, restriction uh, in this respect. Um, also, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, was told in the Quran about those who have been cursed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not only that you do not help others rather they prevent others from helping those who are in need so we have to give we have to assist we have to help the hadith says the upper hand is better than the lower hand and begin with the one who is under your guardianship. When he said al yadul ulya khayrun min al yadul sufla, he said also, uh, the hadith says al-mu'min al-qawi khayrun min al-mu'min al-da'if wa fi kullin khayr. Sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed you with means and others are being tested with lack of means. So those who have should assist those who do not have. Whenever I am a person who puts his trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala truly and does the true tawakkul, uh, I try to find the means to earn it or to achieve it lawfully. While I know for certain that Allah the Almighty will help me out, will assist me to achieve my goal or to get my provision. So there is no conflict in this respect. Brothers and sisters, um, let me take another question before we go for a short break. Sister Sarah Malik is asking, I have a question about uh, good and bad deeds. When does uh, the Karam and Katibin, the angels, start writing our deeds? When kids, uh, when a kid is born or whenever he reaches the age of maturity? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa our most beloved, answered this question when he said رُفِعَ الْقَلَمُ عَنْ ثَلَاثٍ uh, Al-Qalam refers to the pen which the angels who are in charge of recording our deeds they record our deeds with in writing so that pen when I'm writing the pen is on the sheet and when I left it so I'm not recording anything okay so the Prophet ﷺ said رُفِعَ القلم. the pen does not record the actions of three categories of people. I counted one of them, عن الصبي حتى يبلو. The child, whether it's he or she, until they reach the age of puberty. The age of puberty. Which is for the girl, certainly whenever she experiences the menses. Once a girl experiences the menses, خلاص. Now the recording have started. Before that, whether for a boy or a girl, only the angel of recording or who's in a charge of recording the good deeds is busy recording what I do. So let's say that, MashaAllah, you're 
five, six, seven, eight years old. You're not balagh yet. But mashallah, you pray like adults. You fast through the whole month of Ramadan. Perhaps you have finished memorizing the Quran. These are all good deeds. MashaAllah, all of that has been recorded and it benefits you. But you've done some bad things that is not recorded upon you or against you. Why? Because you are still under the age of accountability. That is what the Prophet ﷺ said. A woman was performing Hajj and she raised a child before the Prophet ﷺ and she said, Ya Rasulullah Ali, had a Hajj. Would this child's Hajj be accepted? Is it valid for him to perform Hajj? I'm taking him with me. He said, yes, walaki ajr. Yes, his Hajj will be accepted or valid and you will be rewarded for carrying him to perform Hajj. Brothers and sisters, why don't we take a short break and we'll be back inshallah in a few minutes to answer some more of your valuable questions. Please stay tuned. intentions today issues around the heart how to be a leader how to understand yourself and others community is a diverse group of people how will you deal with the problems charity begins at home as a proverb would say how can we make a successful family among ourselves communication skills is one of the most important things that you should know how do we deal with the many conflicts in our lives today Join us on Huda TV in Youth Matters where we'll talk about different aspects and subjects related to youth and highlight the importance of youth in the development of the Ummah. So how have you been, man? Yeah, I'm, I'm good, Sheikh. How are you? Very good to see you. So how are you? How's your family? Yeah, alhamdulillah. So how's the Muslim community in the UK as well? Yeah, they're okay. But you know, some of the youth, they're facing issues. You know, there's a lot of problems in the Muslim community, you know, to, like do, with, to do with love and marriage and a divorce. Oh, come on. This is always like that. Yeah, but I think a lot of these things could be avoided. You know, if mm. they just study and learn about Islam, mm -hmm. learn about what Islam has to say about all these things. So what are you suggesting? Well, I'm thinking maybe we can do a program okay. where I ask you some questions. We can ask about the questions to do with love and marriage and divorce and go through all the rulings, go through all the advice. I like the idea. You think? Especially as a marriage counselor, I've been yeah. following up with the divorce rate worldwide and uh, including yeah. among Muslims. Muslim communities, whether living in the West or even in Muslim societies, yeah. it's really scary. Yeah. There is a big time rise in the divorce rate. Yeah. It's very scary. And I believe uh, the main reason is simply lack of knowledge. Yeah. People get married and they don't know much about the responsibilities that they need to shoulder, yeah. the ahkam, the rules and regulations. That's why they, yeah. they just divorce each other three, four, five times yeah. and they don't know. I mean, Sheikh, we could cover all this in a nice series where okay. you know, I think it'd be really helpful. Well, what do you think? If you are going to host me, yeah. I will be more than happy to do it. Yeah, I mean, what do you want to call it? What I want to call it, what about fiqh of love? Fiqh of love? Yeah. I like that. So this way we discuss all, we need to discuss about love, marriage, marriage maintenance, and what is in between, all the way to divorce and khula. MashaAllah. So make sure you tune in to this brand new series of the fiqh of love. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.
One day the Prophet ﷺ came out to the companions عنهم, and he said to them, don't you bear witness that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one worthy of worship and he has no partners? Don't you bear witness that I'm the messenger of Allah? Don't you bear witness that the Quran is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So the companions عنهم, they said, yes, O Prophet of Allah. Then the Prophet وسلم, said, فأبشروا. have the glad tidings, the great news as a result of this. Because the Quran has two ends to it. One end with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and one end in your hands. Then he said to them alayhi salatu wasalam, فَتَمَسَّكُوا بِهِ Hold fast to it because you would never be led astray and you would never be perished if you're holding fast to the book of Allah. Because of that, join us every week in Quran in depth where we recite and reflect and ponder over the verses of the Quran. We go in depth into the verses following the ways of the Prophet ﷺ and the companions when they used to take the verses, one set of verses after another. They would recite it, they would reflect upon the meanings of it and they would act according to it and then they would go to the next set of verses. Join us every week in Quran in depth so that we would recite and reflect and learn more about the book of Allah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless our life and to make us among those who follow the Quran and the way of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back. Our phone numbers should appear on the bottom of the screen for your reference. And uh, on the page right now in the earlier segment, I have a few questions. What the Islam is asking? Uh, Assalamu alaikum, Shaykh. To get my dua accepted, what to do? Should I pray tahajjud or should I recite Rud Ibrahim or Istighfar? Please make dua for me. Uh, may Allah enable you to overcome your hardship and make it easy for you. Ameen. Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas, may Allah be pleased with him, who was such a great companion, who was among the pioneers who first accepted Islam, and also who was the Prophet's uncle. He came to the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, and said, Ya Rasul Allah, ask Allah for me to make my dua accepted, to accept my dua always. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to him, Ya Sa'd, atud mat'amaka takun mustajab al-da'wa. You want your dua to be answered? You want your invocation and supplication to be accepted? Make sure that you eat from halal. Eat from lawful earning. Your dua will be accepted. That is a cornerstone in this respect. You add to that the etiquette of making dua, it's best to be in a state of tahara, having wudu, facing the qibla, raising your hands, making the dua at the times where it is most likely the dua will be accepted such as by the end of the prayers before making the sleep, at the time of making sujood, if you happen to be fasting, voluntary or mandatory fasting, at the time of breaking your fast uh, at Maghrib, uh, in the last one third of the night, a few minutes before making uh, offering the Fajr prayer between the Adhan and Iqama on, uh, on Jumu'ah Friday uh, between Asr and Maghrib, the, that time is one of the most precious times. The dua is most certainly answered. As the Prophet وسلم, said, there is some time on Friday where the dua will be uh, answered. Also, you begin by dua by praising the Almighty Allah and sending the peace and salutation upon Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then you present your need, ask for whatever which is lawful. Then you wrap up your dua by again sending the peace and the blessings upon the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It is said because every time you send the peace and salutation upon the Prophet, it is elevated and it is accepted. So when you send it in the beginning and by the end, it envelops your 
dua, which means it will be accepted as well. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Brother Mujahid from Canada. Assalamu alaikum, Brother Mujahid. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Sheikh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ahlan wa sahlan. Welcome to Ask Oda Mujahid. You tell me, how old are you? Thank you. I'm 13. MashaAllah, Mujahid. Go ahead. What do you have in mind? Um, Sheikh, I wanted to ask, is there any dua for going into the washroom or any dua uh, for, uh, uh, like, for uh, taking bath or uh, doing wudu uh, during bath? Okay. And what happens? And what happens if we forget to do the dua? All right. Before entering the washroom. Okay. Thank you, Mujahid. Barakallahu feekum. Yes, of course. There is a list of invocations before doing and after doing certain things. And by the grace of Allah, we filmed a few clips uh, showing when and how to say those supplications and their meaning, the Arabic and the English meaning. They will be aired, inshallah, in a matter of a few days. So before uh, walking to the place in which the person answers the call of nature, the Prophet ﷺ has told us that those places are being inhabited by the jinn. Angels do not cross into this area. So when one enters a bathroom, for instance, nowadays, then before you walk in, you step in with the left foot and you say, أعوذ بك من الخبث والخبائث. You seek refuge with Allah against the jinn, male and female, the evil jinn, male and female. And this dua is marvelous. And Muslims who recite this supplication upon entering the bathroom will be definitely protected from being possessed with the jinn Many cases that happen to even non-Muslims, not only Muslims. Uh, because in the bathroom area, the people think this is a place where you spend time, you know, browsing online and reading the papers or watching TV. This is a place of answer and the call of nature. It is inhabited by the jinn. It's simply to, uh, you know, do whatever you have to do of doing number one or number two, then stepping out. Also, before making wudu, it is recommended to begin by the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At tasmiya, or mentioning the name of Allah in the beginning of wudu and the beginning of wasla, is recommended. It is true that some of the scholars said it's a must, and it is uh, one of the conditions of the validity of wudu, but the more right view that it is recommended. So Mujahid may ask, what if as most of our houses, the shower place happens to be in the bathroom. So in the bathroom, I don't mention the name of Allah. I don't talk. And how can I just say Bismillah while making wudu or before performing ghusl while I'm in the bathroom? You say it, but without moving your tongue. So you can say it by your heart. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Brother Ali from the USA. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam, Shaira. I have one question. Sure. Uh, Shaira, you know how you uh, you pray for protection in the morning and then evening. So my question is, every time I do the, like I read the three fakia, the three surahs of the of Quran, and then I read the Yatul Kursi, and then I rub it, I rub it on my body. Is that a bidah or is it allowed? No, this is perfectly fine. And this is also a means of ruqya. It is true that that is prescribed prior to going to sleep. But also you can do it any time. Before going to work, uh, before going to sleep. Because this is one of the means of ruqya. Okay? Barakallahu feek. Brother Ali from the USA. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Brother Hassan from the USA. Welcome to Ask Oda, akhi. Go ahead. How you doing, brother? I'm doing great, alhamdulillah. Uh, bro, my, my question is uh, is about praying. Praying with the shoes and taking wudu with the shoes. Because I saw some people taking wudu with the shoes out of taking the shoes. 
and they just wipe the top of the shoes. But I know about the sack, but the shoes, I'm just kind of confused. If we can leave the shoes and take wudu and pray with the shoes. You know, Hassan, there is a difference. And, uh, Hassan, you know, there is a difference between shoes and boots, right? Okay. So the, yes. the, peop the people whom you saw, they were wiping over their boots or shoes. Okay. Okay. It was the shoes, like the, the boot, the sneakers. The sneakers, okay. Sneakers. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And pray with and take it with the sneakers. Sure, sure. Your second question? And the second question is uh, is about someone with a, uh, if he become Muslim, wasn't born as is. Mm hmm. <laughs> okay, let me answer uh, Hassan's uh, question and perhaps the next episode inshallah I can call back because we ran out of time. Uh, wiping over one's uh, leather socks or cotton socks, fabric socks or boots is permissible provided the person happened to have wudu before putting them on. So he or she was in a state of tahara. It's not necessarily true that I have to be because due to cold weather or because of I'm traveling. No, the Prophet Sallallahu appointed the time for the muqeem. Somebody who is healthy, who is resident, he's not traveling 24, uh, 24 hours. And for the traveler, 72 hours, three days and three nights. For the muqeem, a day and night where you can keep uh, uh, simply you can keep uh, wiping over your socks or your boots provided they cover the ankles and that's why I asked you whether you saw them doing so on the shoes or the boots because on the shoes it won't work because the shoes they go beneath the ankles it, it, it replaces performing wudu so the ankles must be covered then if your socks or your boots were long enough, then you have been to have wudu. Next time you need to make wudu, you don't have to take them off. You can just simply with your fingers and wipe over the right foot, then the left foot from top, not from the bottom. And the Prophet ﷺ did so. Al-Mughira ibn Shu'ba radiyallahu anhu rated that I was pouring water for the Prophet ﷺ to perform wudu. Then when it came to washing his feet, I uh, fell on the ground in order to uh, help him to take off his uh, khuf. He said, Da'huma fa'inni adkhaltuhuma tahiratayn. Leave them on because I put them on while in a state of wudu. Then Ali ibn Abi Talib radiyallahu anhu narrated that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa appointed a time span a day and night for a resident and for a traveler three days and three nights. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to teach us what we don't know and to help us to work according to the guidance that is revealed in the Quran and the sound sunnah of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And may Allah protect you all brothers and sisters against every evil. Aqulu qawli hada wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala ahli wa sahbihi wa sallam. Do not forget to share uh, what you've seen and also subscribe to the YouTube channel. Until next time, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allah is my heart's speech. Your mercy is what I beseech. Keep in my heart your remembrance and in your deen. Allah.